Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the upcoming Dead by Daylight narrative experience by Supermassive Games. The casting of Frank Stone. Because the teasers have started to arrive, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Let's begin by casting our minds back to DBD's 7th anniversary that took place this summer. There were a ton of announcements back then, I don't blame you for forgetting this one. There was the movie, another game coming up by Midwinter Entertainment in the works, the Ikumi Nakamura skins, Naughty Bear, Slipknot, Iron Maiden, and Nick Cage himself, all revealed in their anniversary. But that was also the first time the Supermassive game that was at the time unnamed was revealed to be in the pipeline. A few days ago, Supermassive Games dropped the teaser for this new game and gave it a name. The Casting of Frank Stone. And this thing that we'd all known about for a while suddenly became very real to the community at large. This announcement took an idea of a game, something that was pushed at us in a very packed live stream, almost like it was maybe going to be happening, but we'll see, and made that idea very concrete and immediate. We had a name, key art, a Steam page, an approximate release window of 2024, and most interestingly of all, some teaser materials that really got speculation engines in motion ahead of the game's eventual release. Today we'll be taking a look at the early material, supermassive and behaviour have shown us to get the measure of casting, and I'd like to talk to you about what the game might look like based on what you've been shown. But before we look at casting itself, I think we ought to look at the developers behind it. The British game studio, Supermassive Games. Founded in 2008, Supermassive Games has been renowned and consistent players in the horror game landscape for over 10 years, ever since the release of Until Dawn in 2012 that really put them on the map. Until Dawn was a massively popular game with players due in large part to branching decision making points and character driven narratives that could end in really anyone living or dying. And while Until Dawn never got a true sequel, although it did get a prequel, the same storytelling style became a staple for supermassive games going forwards. The Quarry and the Dark Pictures anthology series were all governed by the same choice driven variable ending narrative philosophy and took a similar approach to horror as Until Dawn as well. Supermassive really likes paying homage to classics of horror history, similar as Dead by Daylight. I've noticed that for the most part, Supermassive's antagonists don't really do a lot that hasn't been done before. They're not exactly subversive in that regard. But because the focus is on the victims, the characters in danger, and the choices that they make than the danger itself, this doesn't really become an issue most of the time. Which brings us to the casting of Frank Stone. Because at least according to the trailer, this is like a very super massive game. The focus from the start is put on the group of friends investigating the steel mill, with almost no screen time dedicated to Frank himself. This is a far cry from, say, a DBD chapter trailer, where a lot of emphasis is placed on the killer and whatever grisly fate they have in store for the survivors. The emphasis isn't placed on the man, but on the mystery. And this is a great start for making the game feel like a super massive project, the kind of thing behaviour couldn't do on their own. The setting does this credit as well. The choice of a big, abandoned steel mill as a setting is very on brand for Supermassive. We've had games from them set in an abandoned quarry, an abandoned mine, an abandoned town, an abandoned temple, and an abandoned ship. And now we're getting an abandoned steel mill. What's next, an abandoned pizzeria? Nah, no one would make a horror game about that, right? In any case, the cedar steel plant as a setting feels very natural, both for Supermassive and for Dead by Daylight. An abandoned industrial plant is one of DBD's most famous places after all, the McMillan Estate. And even in the teaser there are a couple of things that show Supermassive are really trying to mix two together faithfully. Images like the hook and the generator have basically been taken straight from the game, and the pharmacy in Cedar Hills is even called the Afterpiece Tonic. Like, you gotta admit, that's a nice touch. When we look at all this in aggregate though, and when combined with Frank's Ramshaw costume made from bits from the steel mill, it does spark a little concern in me. Clearly the steel mill was meant to be, in part, an allusion to the Trapper. But combining that with the outfit that's also reminiscent of the Trapper does worry me a smidge because it indicates Supermassive might be doing what they did with other games like the Quarry and relying too much on nostalgia, on players pointing at the thing they recognise, as opposed to maybe a more risky design that breaks new ground using the existing source material as a template. Dead by Daylight, for what it's worth, excels at this. Deathslinger, Oni, Plague, Blight, and Twins are all great examples of DBD trying something new with established formulas and it paying off in spectacular fashion. This unfortunately looks like it might be the only aspect of Dead by Daylight the Supermassive is struggling to imitate. I worry that Frank and Cedar Steel are a little too similar to Trapper and the Macmillan Estate to the point they might overlap too much. This is not a unique opinion either. A lot of people who saw these teasers think Frank will eventually become a Trapper legendary or something. 
and the casting of Frank's own Twitter account had to shoot down the idea of Frank and Trapper being connected. But I think this similarity is entirely by design. And to show you why, I need you to see the teaser Supermassive posted of Frank's workbench at the steel mill. You can look at the teaser for yourself on the casting of Frank's website, link in the description. It's full of a bunch of clues about what Frank's been working on. From a bloody hammer he seems to have modified himself, to newspaper headlines about a double murder in Cedar Hills. But what caught my eye is this. His notebook containing catalogues of weapons he's implied to have used against his victims, and a drawing that he did of the costume he was planning. This paints a picture of Frank Stone becoming a mass slasher as not just something that happened on a whim, but a meticulously planned long-term project. Frank's implied murders, the act of putting on the mask and costume and spilling blood, are not moments of emotional impulse, but are instead done with a clear goal in mind. I think I've worked out what that goal might be, but to understand that I'm going to need to talk briefly about a piece of DBD lore that's been constantly recurring over the past few years. The overlaps. The overlaps are Hadi Kaur's term for the places where the veil between the real world and the realm of the entity is at its thinnest. These are typically sites of deep emotional disturbance that disrupt the auric particles that comprise the realm, such as morgues, mass graves, or slaughterhouses. Overlaps can influence the people around them and give them glimpses into the realm of the entity, especially if they're already sensitive to these things, like Hadi Kaur, Carmina Mora, or Michaela Reed. And I think Frank's another case of someone sensitive to the entity's presence. The Cedar Hill Tribune newspaper clipping found at Frank's workbench shows us two people implied to have been killed by Frank, but if you read on, a third murder has happened a little while ago, one for whom the perpetrator was found and apprehended, i.e. it wasn't Frank. The emotional disturbance caused by this murder, especially if Frank witnessed it or was close to the victim, may have created an overlap into the realm of the entity that Frank would be able to perceive. Here is what I think has happened. Frank in some way has been able to look into the realm of the entity and has seen the trials firsthand, similar to how Michaela has done. Frank has witnessed the horrors of the fog and the killers who serve the entity and has decided, yeah, I want some of that life. That's why he's iterating and tinkering with costume designs and weapon choices. That's why his workbench has a bloody meat hook and that drawing of what resembles the entity in this trailer. I think Frank is trying to attract the entity's attention by turning himself into the ideal killer. He's dressing and acting and practicing for the job he wants. It's probably why he looks like Trapper. For all we know, he's seen Trapper in the fog himself and consciously or otherwise decided to model his appearance on what he's already seen. These teasers are full of evidence to support this theory, but the simplest and most obvious clue is right there in front of us. It's the game's title. Casting kind of has two different meanings that both support what I'm saying here. Casting can refer to an actor being cast for a role, which makes sense when you realise that Frank is casting himself into the role of a killer. And also, casting is a process by which a molten metal is poured into a mould to create something. Frank is allowing the entity to mould him into the perfect killer, melting down his former identity to fit that mould, and that makes even more sense because the central setting for the game is the cedar steel plant, where casting molten metal is just everyday business. I think Frank has been trying to attract the entity for a while, sacrificing victims to it as he perfects the art of the killer to repair his attention into the fog. I think eventually, he succeeded in getting its attention. The Cedar Hills Tribune article is dated September 1962, so that's probably when Frank was actively killing, but the investigators that we see in the present day of the game appear to be from much later than that, so the entity likely took him in the meantime. Let's remember though, this is still purely speculation based on what we've been shown, and I could be completely wrong here. That's a theory that I'm sticking with until the game comes out, and I can take a proper look. Because don't you worry, I will be taking a proper look. If the overlaps are part of the casting of Frank Stone though, there is one idea I want you to bear in mind. Sometimes in a story involving the overlaps, things can come through. There have been several occasions where killers or other monsters from the fog have come through to the real world temporarily. The Oni has done it multiple times, and at one point Trapper did it too. So if the overlaps are a part of Frank Stone's story, I think an appearance from an existing original killer stepping into the real world is not off the table. Especially if Frank is already gone by the time the investigators arrive at the Cedar Steel plant, there might be a time where the mystery of what's happened to Frank needs to be preserved, whilst still giving a tangible threat to our characters. 
so an existing original killer being drafted in as a temporary antagonist stepping through from the overlaps would be a good way to break up the pacing and emphasise that Frank really isn't unique in his service to the entity. I imagine whoever they choose for this would be fairly important to the lore. Someone like Trapper, Oni, Blight or Dredge. But I personally believe it would be really, really funny if the killer Supermassive picked out to represent DVD's existing cast would be, of all characters, the Skull Merchant. Just imagine the absolute tide of salt and gamer rage that would explode from the fanbase like a volcano. It gives me life, it really does. It'll never, ever happen, ever, but remember, anyone watching at Supermassive if you're here, you have the opportunity right now to do the funniest thing anyone has ever done, so um, just bear that in mind for me, okay? Until Dawn laid the foundations for what a supermassive game would look like for years to come, and the casting of Frank Stone at least seems to be the logical evolution of that into Dead by Daylight's big dark multiverse. Even at this early stage, Supermassive seems to be on the right track by blending a choice-based and character-driven modus operandi we've come to expect from Supermassive with the images and ideas that make Dead by Daylight's approach to horror stand out from the crowd. A big game like DBD getting a spin-off isn't unexpected, but that spin-off, being made by a different company, most certainly is. And I just hope Supermassive's got the balls to make the casting of Frank Stone feel as distinct as a game as unusual as this one deserves to be. As opposed to just the quarry with a Trapper-themed texture pack. Well, either way, it'll be releasing next year, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Because I, for one, will be watching with great anticipation. That's everything I have to say for now about the casting of Frank Stone. I'm really looking forward to the release next year, but... We have a lot of time to theorise before then, so tell me what you think of my theory and let me know if you've got any of your own. While you're down in those comments, I've got two things to ask of you. First, obviously do the whole subscribing thing if you want to see more videos from me. But also, the January Pleasure Problems community poll is still open and will be till Christmas Day. Those who don't know, Pleasure Problems series is when I look at a particular licence that isn't in Dead by Daylight, yet. Explore the possibility of its arrival by understanding what makes the tick as a setting and usually design a power for whatever killer I believe it could contribute. Our candidate killers for January's video are the T-1000 Terminator, the Repo Man from Repogenetic Opera, a Big Daddy from Bioshock, Homelander from The Boys and Gen V, and Pennywise from Stephen King's It. Right now, Bioshock is winning by a pretty handy margin, but there's still a pretty meaningful chance that Homelander takes it back. So get your votes in. And on that note, I'll see you again very soon for my last video of 2023. Take care now.